Um, now, my great pleasure to welcome back to the Institute Fabrizio Ricciardelli, who is Florentine, um, uh, born and bred proper Florentine, but went on to study internationally and uh, wound up doing a PhD at the University of Warwick in England uh, in Renaissance history, which is his specialist subject. Um, he's for the last 12, 11, 12 years, has been the director of the Kent State Study Abroad Program here in Florence. And welcome to some of the students from Kent State. Nice to have you with us. Um, and uh, he's also published some significant and, and valuable books, A Short History of Florence and Medici, strongly recommended. Um, if you want a, you know, really knowledgeable primers on, on what's going on around here, um, I imagine you'll sign copies if people buy them afterwards. So they're on, <laughs> they're, they're on sale afterwards. Um, so without further ado, I hand Pastor La Parola uh, to my good friend Fabrizio to tell us all about the rise of power of the Medici in the, in the Quattrocento. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon, for, for your introduction. It's a privilege and honor for me to be here tonight. Of course, you recognize from my accent that I'm not British, evidently. I'm Florentine, and, um, but I got a PhD in England, which is for me, which changed my life, I have to say, because uh, after that experience, I got a position at Georgetown University in the US, and then I became the director of the Kent State University program, Florence program here. And um, that's the job I'm doing. Uh, by trade, I'm an historian, so I study the Renaissance. My PhD dissertation in England was uh, on the politics of exclusion in Renaissance Florence, let's say from the 1250s until the 1450s. And uh, more than everything, because my uh, mentor, Humphrey Butters in the UK, was really connected to studying the roots of democracy, this remained to me something very care. And I continue working on this topic for the rest of my academic years. Tonight, I will talk about uh, the rise of uh, the Medici family, meaning that I will try to see the moment in which in the Florentine Republican system, we have a change in terms of a political dimension, which is uh, uh, determined by the rise of uh, the family. The first um, concept to analyze, I think, should you be involved in the analysis of the roots of democracy, and Florence is uh, one of the most interesting uh, stages through which you can study the roots of democracy, because um, Florence is from the 1280s, a Repubblica, res publica, it is uh, the thing of the people, according to Cicero. And uh, mm, at least in theory, at the center of the uh, governmental spirit, you have the citizen, which is, of course, uh, one of the main ingredients through which you can talk about democracy, you can talk about what Aristotle theorizes in the second book of politics. With this said, we are in the time of Dante, meaning from the 1250s, 60s, uh, until uh, the plague of 1348. And in Florence, we have uh, the real revolution, governmental revolution, which leads the state to have to be governed by the so-called popolo. Now, should you open a dictionary nowadays, you would have as a meaning of popolo people. But it is evident that those who were living in Florence at that time were not the people, were not the commoners, were not those who, as in our democracy, may, you know, could stand for public offices. We have a selection of citizens, so it's not all the society which can run for public offices. Who are they? Who are the members of the popolo? What kind of relationship we have between them, the city, the government, and what kind of relationship we have between them and the nobility, the aristocracy? And of course, the Medici are part of the popolo. So this is the reason why I'm talking about this, because the Medici are uh, intense and uh, uh, have an intense connection with uh, with uh, the noun popolo. The popolo is uh, divided according to the sources. I'm talking meaning mostly about Giovanni Villani's Chronicle of Florence, uh, popolo grasso and popolo minuto. Now, should you want to give a 
in English translation of both, we might say that the Popolo Grasso has, as my friend Sam Cohn from the US of Glass is used to translating them, the fat cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those who had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, who are those who are members of the Popolo Minuto? And those who are in practice poor, those who do not have public rights. Um, this is, of course, uh, reducing the reasoning because uh, the Popolo is a quacervo, has ma and manifold meanings can be given to the noun Popolo. But in general terms, so both are what we define now the middle class. So in Florence, we are in front of many middle classes, because the Popolo Minuto is part of the Popolo as well as the Popolo Grasso, which are making the city existing. So the government of the city working, functioning. And, uh, and this is very interesting because uh, that's the reason why many British historians are interested on in the case of Florence, many Americans, you know, trying to find in the roots of both, both democracies as well as Italians. So in 1292 in Florence, we have a butcher elected as a member of the priors. The priorate is uh, the executive power of the city of Florence. You could stand for the priorate should you be a member of the popolo. So only the members of the popolo could stand for public offices. And the priorate is uh, reconnecting the state within the executive power. So both legislative and executive power are made of both realities, members of the popolo, no matter what kind of guild they were uh, part of. At the beginning, we have also the popolo minuto because a butcher is not involved, considered, uh, you know, someone involved in the Popolo Grasso, because, um, you know, this is uh, what I've written in this in this slide is a rough definition of, of, of Popolo Grasso, but more or less you have the Arti Maggiori, what well, we define the Arti Maggiori, the major guilds of the city, meaning those who knew how to write and read, judges and notaries, those involved in the judiciary, let's say. And then, of course, the two main uh, prop profitable institutions uh, of the city, meaning the wool and the silk industry. Then, of course, uh, those who cured bodies, doctors, and the uh, guild of uh, Medici and Speziali is connected. So the spice sellers are connected to doctors. So we have uh, this uh, guild as one of the major guilds. And then, of course, you have uh, those who are called Kalimala, Kalemale, no? Those who are the so-called merchants, those who traded, went from a place to another. What about the Popolo Minuto? All the others. All the others. But this doesn't mean, and this is something I will talk about in a few minutes, that they didn't have the same kind of uh, social possibilities as the others. Florence is a very strange case because of this. Florence is very important because of this. Because also the Popolo Minuto had a good... Uh, way of living in the city of Florence, in average. Now, this is a slide I've taken in the city of Florence when I was a student, and I had time for going there to study the manuscripts of the Arte della Lana, the statute of the Arte della Lana. Every guild is uh, contributing to the concept of the popolo. So the popolo is made of guildsmen. The popolo is made of popolani grassi and popolani minuti. But all of them are guildsmen, no matter what kind of profession you were practicing. But you should have contributed to the state according to the percentage of money you would have received on an yearly basis. This is the point and the uh, interesting relationship between the guilds and the popolo. Of course, the wool guild, you know, it's uh, one of the most, uh, one of the richest guilds of the city. And of course, you, they could pay the best notaries who could, you know, copy their statutes in a very good graphic way, as you can see from this fantastic manuscript, which is the beginning of the statue of the Wool Guild in the Serra Cup of Florence, Arte della Lana, number four, one of the files. Now, I have roughly synthesized what the guild system means in the city of Florence. More or less, they produce 100,000 pieces per year, and we have around 30,000 people involved. 
in the wool industry. What are we, am I talking about? Giovanni Villani talks about the city of Florence as one of the most important centers of the Renaissance, of the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, let's say. So the time of Dante, to be precise. Um, and he talks about that before the plague of 1348, in which unfortunately he died, he died in June 1348, without having completed the third book of his chronicle, Giovanni Villani considers that Florence has um, 100,000 habitants, 100,000 citizens, more or less. 30,000, so is more than, is less than one third of the society involved in only one guild. Think how important was the world guild at that time. And this will be great and very important for, for the rise of the Medici, because you will see the link in a few seconds. Because, uh, because, uh, Within the 1300s, or during the 1300s, mostly right after the plague of 1348, in which, according to Marchione di Coppo Stefano, another very important chronicler, we have uh, the loss of around the 70% of the Florentine people. Florence was in the process of rebuilding itself. You can teach me how many years you need to create a, a surgeon in our society, more than 30 years, you know, a professional. So Florence was uh, granting citizenships to all the main masters of, uh, of the surrounding area, you know, inviting them to be citizens. But we have, and when I was students at the University of Warwick, I spent a lot of, you know, a lot of time in the city of Florence. And while I was, collecting all the uh, the acts of exclusion, I was also collecting the arts acts of inclusion. And they are very few before 1348. We have a lot after 1348, because Florence was in the moment of, uh, was in the need of accept accepting immigrants in the city, especially high level immigrants, professionals in every possible field now, and here we go with the reasoning I'm trying to lead tonight. So the fact that we have a specifically, mostly from the 1350s onwards, the increasing of the discrepancy between, between the popolo. So the, uh, the, 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 the distance between the popolo grasso and the popolo minuto increases, grows, grows exponentially and explodes in 1378. Everybody knows the Chompi uprising. <clears throat> Many have uh, written, you know, books and uh, papers on the Chompi Revolution. Should you want to give a, a, a name and, you know, a meaning to the noun Chompi, we have a piazza, I believe, very close to it in Via dei Maci. Huh? Piazza dei Chompi, Chompo, uh, the Chompi, Chompo doesn't mean anything, you know, but it connotates people. Hmm? So you are a Chompo, should you have lived in the 1370s, uh, if you were involved in the wool industry with no political rights. In other words, one of the most important ingredients of the, of the industry, you know, without uh, the possibility of standing for any public office. And of course, uh, you were, as well as the others, enrolled in the guilds, but there was a distance between you and the masters. Let me give an example. When Brunelleschi completed the Dome in 1436, uh, the commission was his, uh, was not given to the thousands of people who were working with him at the completing of the, uh, the, the Dome of, of Florence, which lasted more or less four years. So it means that he received the commission from the, of course, Medici family first. Uh, and I will talk about briefly about that because Cosimo had a big role on that, but also the fabric of the Dome. Uh, and then with this money as an interpreter, he distributed according to the profession among the different workers who were working with the, for, for completing the job. So it means that we have a progressive uh, distance between the rich popolani and poor popolani. And of course, we have also the creation of medium popolani because, uh, because uh, the middle class uh, has manifold meanings in this period of time.
At any rate, what happens in 1348, so we are in June, and we have, uh, you know, the explosion of this phenomenon. So the, the poor Popolani, knowing perfectly that they were the most important ingredient for making the wool industry, one of the most profitable institutions in the city, which gave work to 30,000 people and so on, you know, didn't suffer anymore this situation. So what happens is that Salvestro de Medici, and here we go with the Medici family, Salvestro de Medici, flag in hand, you know, went all over the city trying to kill all the magnets, all the Popolani Grassi, all those who were pushing down the Popolani Minori in the city. And here we open one of the biggest questions, you know, in history ever, and I won't answer that question tonight, because historians usually do not answer questions, try to, you know, promote questions and doubts. But surely there is a question which is very important. You know, I wrote down a, a book on the Medici family a few months ago with this question in mind. You know, what kind of interest Salvestro de Medici, one of the most important bankers of the city, had to defend the rights of the poor people of Florence? Because this is the point. He risked his own life. But this, and I cannot answer this question. The only thing I can tell you is that from that moment onwards, the Medici, especially in the 1400s, were perceived among one of the most, you know, interesting kind of family, very close to the poor people. So when Cosimo the Elder gave the commission to complete Palazzo Medici Riccardi in Via Larga, now Via Cavour, the gates of the building could stay open also at night because uh, no one would have ever attacked Cosimo because he was considered the first among equals, primus inter pares. So no matter if Salvestro planned this act or not, the very fact is that the Medici family through Salvestro de' Medici, defending the roots and defending the rights of the poor members of the Popolo Minuto, entered by default within the spotlight of uh, the love of the people. Now, the society we built after the Chompia Prize, and here I'm going very fast, evidently, uh, but in that more or less, 50 years between 1378 and 1434 was, uh, you know, <clears throat> going in the direction I was indicating before. So the discrepancy between the rich Popolani and the poor Popolani increased, continued to increase. Uh, and now what do we have? We have uh, Florence, the Republic of Florence, the Res Publica Florentina, in the need of... Uh, you know, acting as well as the other states of the time. I'm thinking about Venice, who was, uh, you know, uh, fighting continuously against the Duchy of Milan, uh, pushing, who was trying to push Venice through the sea. Uh, the Kingdom of Naples, uh, the papal state in the middle of the country, the Republic of Florence was in need of expanding itself. The typical situation we find, let's say, at the beginning of the 1400s, the need of creating new outposts, you know, expanding the borders of your state. Of course, Florence was a city state in its beginning, a republican state in its mature phase. And we are in this moment, in the moment in which San Gimignano was conquered, and we are in 1356. Pisa was conquered, and we are in 1404. And then Vol Volterra was conquered in 1411. And then, then the chest of the Florentine Republic went down. No money anymore, because wars could be led only through the good payment of good soldiers, mercenaries, i mercenari. And of course, what happened? The genius of Florence, evidently. The, the ability of collecting money, uh, Without, without, without impositions, let's say, was indicted the first tax record of the Western world after the Domesday book 
of William the Conqueror in 1066, but this time is a systematic tax record, catasto. Should you go in the Serra Cup of Florence, you will see, you know, many manuscripts, all of them big this way in parchment, in which I have one by one, name after name, all the Florentine people who were living at that time, 1427, and uh, the collection of their patrimony. So you know perfectly, name by name, how much money they had, how many properties they had, what kind of properties they had inside of the city as well as outside of the city. And uh, more or less, we are in front of uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of analysis, uh, thanks to Brown University, which from the 1970s uh, employed, hired a lot of PhD students. I was not one of them because I went in England to study. You know, but, but uh, many friends of mine were working with Tony Moll and many others you know, from, the, from Brown University to collect information, study book by book, because uh, these books should have been studied you know, and collected and transcribed. And what do we find? And now the tax record is open. You, know, you can go online and see everything from the beginning to the end. You know, the patrimony of Palastrozzi, Giovanni di Bici de' Medici, Cosimo the Elder. So all the Florentines who were living in the 1420s Florence. What comes out from this tax record? The cynical historian gets information which are used to try to give an explanation to historical data, events, the ritual process of history. And the richest person of the city is not Giovanni di Bici de' Medici, is not Cosimo the Elder, is a member of the Strozzi family. So the Medici are not the richest family of the city, are the Strozzi, the first. Uh, uh, a most important uh, family of, of in town. And you can read in this slide that Palastrozzi owned around 100,000 gold florins in his bank account, cash money. More than 30 farms in the countryside and a lot of uh, blocks in the city, meaning revenue from the production of oil and wine in the countryside, Rents, because he rented apartments. No, the housing system of my students at Kent State University has not been created by ourselves. Giovanni is the second, but Cosimo is the first. And what counts is this. And here we have another, we are in front of another, I think, crucial, crucial question. Why everyone remembers the Medici and no one, no one remembers the Strozzi? Because in theory, the Strozzi should have been, you know, at the top of the society. Why Giovanni de' Medici, who died, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 1400s, replaced by Cosimo the Elder, his son, uh, was not so famous at that time. Very important, but at the top of the society, you have the Strozzi family. Palazzo Strozzi is one of the most beautiful buildings in the city. I don't remember how much it costed, you know, around 20,000 gold florins, you know, a fortune for that time, because I used that parameter for trying to see in, uh, the ban given to Dante Alighieri uh, in 1302, which was uh, comparable to the buying of a building like Palazzo Strozzi. Yeah, a huge fortune for the time. But these people owned uh, 100,000, you know, it, Cosimo, uh, Giovanni di Vici Medici, 80,000 gold florins uh, in his bank account, and revenues from their properties, both inside of the city as well as outside of the city. So the question I'm in front of, these are the data I was talking about a few seconds ago. And of course, you have also that. Uh, the enormous quantity of people who didn't own, have any property in the city, we're talking about 1,600 people, 1,500 people, but who could send their children to study abroad? For example, in Bologna, you know, now they study from Kent State to Florence, or I studied from Florence to, 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 to Coventry, <clears throat> to Warwick, you know. But at that time, studying outside of Florence, going to Bologna to study in one of the most prestigious universities of the West, the first one in the West, actually, was a privilege. Think about Brunetto Latini. Brunetto Latini, master of Dante Alighieri, studied in Paris, a trésor, 
has not been written in Latin or in Italian, has been written in French. So bilingualism, speaking, you know, foreign languages is not something which has been invented by our society. So with this said, also part of the popolo minuto, and here we go with the other concept I tried to, 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 to talk about tonight with you, could afford a good quality of life, could pay a rent, could have the children grown, and could send them also to study abroad. The competition is, of course, between two families, between two people, but also two families. The Strozzi are connected to the Albizzi. And uh, the competition, the rivalry is mostly between Rinaldo and Cosimo at that time. Uh, at the beginning, Cosimo the Elder, after the loss of his father, you know, when his father died, called Giovanni Vici de' Medici, uh, entered and went in ch charge of uh, leading the company of the Medici. We are talking about a money changing system at that time. The banking system was not as ours today. I give you just a practical example because talking about 80,000 gold florins doesn't have any meaning for us. But, you know, I give you something concrete probably to compare the, the power of money at that time. So a good physician, a good surgeon at that time in the 1420s in Florence could earn between two to three gold florins per visit. Now, a good surgeon, how much can he get or she get? like 300 euros, 200 euros, you know, more or less, this is the price. So having 100,000 gold florins in the bank account, 80,000 was a, good, a huge fortune because we are talking about cash money. And then we have the properties. No, we contributed to the increasing of this quantity. of. So we are talking about people like Bill Gates today, like the British, comp British Airways now, like, you know, big companies, huge companies, the Medici had, agencies of their bank all over the known world, North Africa, all Europe, until, the, until Northumberland in England. Then we have Poland, you know, part of Russia, you know, in India, Pakistan, Turkey, and China. So these people traveled. Think about Marco Polo. Think about the traveler by Marco Polo. And we are at the end of the 1200s. So these people, of course, spent a life like Marco Polo, you now going to, to the uh, court of the, of the Ming in China. And uh, thanks to him, you know, giving us one of the most challenging and beautiful books ever written, The, the Traveler, Il Milione. But these people, you know, had an international profile. But internal conflicts, because now the city is, uh, is uh, uh, in the process of defining its ruling class. And it's too profitable to lead Florence at that time, because uh, Rome was not the place to be. Rome is the place to suck, not the place to leave. Rome, until, you know, the jubilee of Pope Boniface VIII enters in use, and the first one is 1300, in which Giotto, Giovanni Villani, Dante himself went, you know, to get the, the plenary indulgence. Ah, it's a place to suck. It's very dangerous to leave, because everybody from the, you know, collapse of the Roman Empire uh, is the place to suck. We need to wait the 1500s the end of the 1520s, you know, because the other one is 1527 with the sack of Rome by Charles V, for having Rome back to the idea of civilization, you know, instead of despoiling the place, the place in which you could invest. So is Florence the place of the Renaissance? Is Florence the center of the industrial activities? Think about the Chapel of the Magi in Palazzo Medici Riccardi, in which you have of course, uh, the tentative by the Medici to create, to reconnect the Eastern and the Western churches, no? the Orthodox and the Christian Catholic one. The, the competition is high at that time. And of course, uh, those who would have won would have controlled the city, meaning all the network 
which was connected to it. And uh, the city is in itself a good economical opportunity. At the beginning, Rinaldo wins and uh, Cosimo has to leave. Cosimo, this is a fresco <clears throat> by Vasari, Giorgio Vasari. We are in, the, in Palazzo Vecchio, uh, very close to the Salone di Cinquecento. And uh, we have Cosimo the Elder, always red dressed, hmm? the color of purity, uh, obliged to leave. Uh -huh. Cosimo is uh, in the act of leaving the city. On the back, you can see Florence, there is a dome there. And of course, we know about uh, Cosimo's exile. He went to Padua, you know, he spent very few years, I would say, because because uh, then uh, the city of Florence asked him to go back you know, because uh, the wise connections of Cosimo were too important for the city of Florence. Uh, and Rinaldo was uh, nothing more than a good soldier, but not a good interpreter. Now, when Cosimo goes back to Florence, of course, the repercussion is very harsh. And here we go with the rise of the Medici. The Medici are making the difference exactly in this period of time, in 1434, when Cosimo is asked to be back, to go back to the city of Florence. And uh, in the judicial system of the Renaissance, you have two plus three methods for excluding people from society because we are not in a tyranny. We are not in a despotic regime. We are in a republic, the Republic of Florence, the res publica. And uh, the methods for excluding people were two on the one hand, and of course, the, the, the clear one, not the death penalty, goes without saying, the elimination, the cancellation of the political memory of the enemy. Oh, this is very easy. Something which was not so practiced in the city of Florence. The majority of cases we find in the archive in the state archive of Florence are mostly connected to the two main subtle way for excluding people, bans and confinements. Now, confinement is, is very easy to, to, to analyze because it, let me think about Mussolini, you know how confinement was used during fascism. Confinement implies is, uh, the strength of the government. So if you have a strong government like the fascist government was in its, uh, you know, in the middle of its 20 years of, uh, unfortunately for Italy, control of the country, you, you could send some, someone outside of the borders, obliging him or her to stay there, controlled and so on and so forth. This is confinement. We find many in the history of Florence in the 12, 13, and 1400s. It is more difficult to find bans. What is the ban? And we go back to the, uh, no, the, 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 the codex of, Ju of, uh, of, uh, of Justinian. Uh, in which the ban is a monetary fine. Usually is a fine which could not be paid by the person who was involved. That's the reason why I was checking how much Palazzo Strozzi costed, because I know how much money Dante Alighieri had to pay for pledging for his, uh, uh, for having betrayed, you know, the state. 5,000 gold florins. At that time, unpayable. Usually the ban is a quantity of money which could not be paid by the person. So you receive a monetary fine. If you are not able to pay it, the judicial system, you know, should you have been imprisoned, you know, allows itself to torture you until confession. And of course, uh, the best way for avoiding it was, uh, you know, remaining outside. So the ban is a sort of, uh, how can I say, subtle way for not exposing the government to any possible kind of decision, but leading, leaving everything in your shoes. You know, you are responsible for your, or your action. You are not respecting the rules. You are out of the system. When Cosimo, and here I go with Cosimo the Elder, when Cosimo goes back, to Florence, 
Of course, Cosimo controls everything, but more than everything, Cosimo controls the Otto di Guardia, the eight on security. Who are they? This is an office among the many you have in the Republican system of Florence, which was very, very well organized in terms of distribution of powers, the fiscal system, judicial system, legislative power, executive power. <clears throat> and of course, the notaries, we have a name, someone named Machiavelli, you know, working on these things in the fifth, at the end of the 1400s, the beginning of the following century. The Otto di Guardia, are whom? Uh, the secret police of the state of Florence, Otto di Guardia, the eight on security. Uh, the eight on security were established in 1378 after the Trompi uprising to reestablish the governmental system of the Popolo Grasso. And of course, the first thing that Cosimo does was putting eight people close to him in that office. And this is what I will do. I hope to do it before I die, <laughs> you know? But there is a, a manuscript in the Sera of France. I didn't quote the, the number of this, uh, of this manuscript because I forgot it, but it's 224. It's Otto di Guardia and Balia, uh, Repubblica 224. This is a uh, folio number 21, 21st uh, recto, recto and verso, in which we have, uh, and here I'm getting blind, let me read it in Italian because it's fantastic. Qui cominciano i confinati, relegati, interdetti, privati degli uffici et sospesi posti a sedere et ammoniti, et condannati per la conservazione del presente pacifico et tranquillo stato della città di Firenze, et qualunque dessi è diventato rubello, rebel, incominciando dall'anno dell'incarnazione del nostro Signore Gesù Cristo, 1438, 48, 38, et dat indi in qua. So the Otto di Guardia in Balia are already trained to repress dissent, are already trained to repress those who are not following the right path of the Republic. And of course, having them, the police, being them, the police forces, the secret police of the city, mostly created to discover any possible kind of potential plot and conspiracy against the state for not repeating what happened in 1378 with the Trumpi uprising. Of course, this was a perfect, the perfect office for Cosimo to reinforce his personal, the power of his family. So through the Otto di Guardia, and here I go with the book I was mentioning, with the manuscript I was mentioning, mentioning before, Cosimo put one after the other in this book, all the enemies of the Medici family. For the first time, for the first time, fusing the interests of a private family to the interest of a Republican system. So you, you need, of, of course, talent to do that, you know, because, because, uh, Cosimo perfectly knew uh, the tradition. He knew perfectly the history of Rome and the change and the passage, which was, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, described by Cicero no? at the end of the Republican period before Augustus in Rome, uh, of the change between a Republican system into a dictatorship. So he was starting the process which would have been completed in a century and something by Cosimo I, actually by Alessandro de' Medici, and then reinforced by Cosimo I in 1537, of the establishment of the Florentine, of the Medici as a royal family in the city, as a dynasty. And here we have some names of those who were put in this uh, Otto di Guardia and Balia, Otto di Guardia and Balia uh, manuscripts. Gianfigliazzi, Guadagni, Peruzzi, Strozzi, Castellani, the Strozzi. Huh? Of course, the main enemy of Cosimo 
is the you know the family which is in economical competition no with, with, with them and uh, through this uh, uh, act of love by the republic of florence by the florentine people who asked him to go back to the city for reinforcing the political and economical profile of the city itself for bringing back all the, the 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 network of supporters which were going out with him in exile when Rinaldo won in 1433 from 1434 Cosimo responded to this going back opening a book putting inside of it all the enemies of the state and starting the process which would have led the family to the history you know now Cosimo is in charge of taking care of the family first and the Republic of Florence the second from 1434 until 1464. In these 20 years, we have the real establishment of a, of a, of a dynasty in the city. And uh, of course, after having controlled the police system, the following step was uh, to control the political system. Because the economical system was already, you know, controlled by the Medici family. To control the political system of the city, the challenge was won from the beginning, evidently, because uh, Cosimo knew perfectly how the Republic of Florence worked. He knew perfectly that no one could, no one, not every, not everyone could stand for public offices because of the reasons I was talking about at the beginning because of the division between Popolo Gras and Popolo Minuto, that the Popolo itself was uh, subdivided in many sections, subsections. And of course, uh, the only way through which he could control the state was controlling those who were put in the backs for being elected. Here you have uh, the Tratte. No? One of the main sources for the Renaissance historian in the state of Cabo Florence are the so-called Tratte. No? It's sort of a nightmare at the beginning. <laughs> as a PhD student, you know, but later you get used to it. What do you have in the tratte? Tratte, trarre in Italian means to pick from a bag, you know, names, by lot, sortition. But of course, if you control all those who are inside and all of them are friends of yours, no matter who will be elected, you know. <clears throat> That's the point, you know. Cosimo, with his uh, network, is able to control all those Sleeps were put in the bags, quarter by quarter. You know, you have three quartieri here, but you have four, of course, because from 1343, Florence was not anymore divided in sixtieri, sixths, but in quarters, huh? in quartieri. Um, e tutora, and also nowadays it is divided in quartieri. You know, that the quartiere projects its power through the countryside as well. Huh? Also nowadays, quartiere uno, due, tre, quattro. It's come from, from the 1300s, this division, this political and economical subdivision of the, of the city. Um, so this is the, the point. Nikolai Rubinstein, one of my mentors as well, you know, at the University of London, who followed my, my discussion of thesis, you know, when I completed it in Warwick, wrote probably one of the most enlightening books on this topic uh, on the way through which the Medici could control a state not only in the 1430s but also in the 1460s, 70s, uh, 80s and part of the 90s. And uh, of course inside of the Tratte you have uh, the real picture framework you know within which you can analyze the history of Florence because you know who they are. You find them also set in the councils. And if they are set in the councils, it means that they voted for certain proposals. And the councils were legislative power as well as executive power. So you could find all the different kind of visions of the different families of the city one by one again, this time, politically speaking. And uh, all of them are involved, uh, put inside of these uh, leather bags and picked at the need whenever the election is done. The elections were done many, many times in Florence because 
one of the criteria for selecting the ruling class was uh, not having them elected for more than two months, which is very tiring. I'm thinking about, you know, <laughs> that every five years you have, we have the elections for the government in Italy, but also for the, you know, the other offices, four or five years, at that time, two months. This means that you needed the control of many people in the bags. No? Because uh, many were the criteria for selecting the offices. The, the, the system talks really aloud about the rules. No? You could not stand for any public office. In other words, you could not be put in any possible bag should you have been bankrupt for instance, or should, should have not be contributed to the state itself. One of the keys to understand the Florentine Renaissance, otherwise we're talking about art and stop, you know, who's Michelangelo or Donatello, what kind of uh, contracts they received, who were those who paid these contracts, where is this money coming from? Uh, these people, contributed to the stage. The guild system in the city of Florence is a very well-oiled mechanism. And the taxation in Italy, sometimes I wonder myself why I don't pay anything if I go to a hospital in Florence or in Rome and so on, because I prepaid it through the taxes. Why my daughter, who is 18 years old, is not paying for studying a Liceo Classico Galileo in Florence? Because I prepaid it, not through my taxes. And taxes are made also nowadays in Italy in proportion to the quantity of the gross money you receive per year. This is exactly the method adopted by the Florentine Republic starting 1282 when the priors were established. Hmm? Dino Compagni wrote about uh, this, this uh, uh, moment and uh, talks about the ways in which the guilds could contribute to the state itself. And the contribution is given in proportion to the gross money I've received per year, meaning those who were involved in the wool industry paid more, those who were butchers, uh, uh, key makers, uh, uh, cup makers, uh, you know, bakers, and so on and so forth. Bakers were, was a very interesting kind of profession in Florence. I gave a lecture at the Teatro Nicolini a few, few months ago, um, that time in Italian, anyways. But, uh, but I reading Giovanni Villani's Chronicle, I realized that we have more bakeries uh, in the 1340s Florence than nowadays. I called Confindus and I asked how many bakeries we have in the city of 86. And I read the Giovanni Villani talks about 146 baker shops in the city of Florence at that time. Of course, bakeries at that time produced cakes, you know, many different kinds of breads like chestnut bread, you know, uh, barley bread, and so on and so forth, according to the flour, which was produced by the peasants, peasants of the time, according to the, the quality of the harvest of that period of time, and so on. But, you know, a bakery was a very important place, you know, especially in a, in a society where, fa where famine was very diffused. So with this said, Cosimo controls the state. Cosimo controls all those who are in the bags. Cosimo controls those who are eligible. So the key word to understand the Medici is eligibility. Are you or are you not? Do you or do you have not the possibility of standing for a public office? If yes, you will be in the bags. Those who are in the book of the Otto di Guardia are not anymore in the city. Who cares about them? All those who are in the city are close, allied to the Medici. And uh, of course, starting 1434, and here I go to the last topic I will touch tonight to complete the framework of the ability of, of Cosimo to establish the Medici in the city of Florence because the rest is history, <clears throat> is patronage. Mecenatismo. It sounds different in Italian. It comes from mecenate. No? A very close friend of Augustus. But from that moment onwards, you have uh, the creation of a concept which was uh, perfectly embraced and absorbed by the Medici. Through patronage, which is apparently the best way for wasting money. 
in practice, you were investing on your legitimization, political legitimization. Art in the Renaissance is never art for art, never. Probably I have a cynical way for, you know, intending it, but uh, it is evident that Michelangelo, 13 years old, discovered by Lorenzo the Magnificent, establishing the first school for artists at the time, a genius by birth, was not simply a great artist. He was the perfect tool for talking about the greatness of Lorenzo. And, uh, and this, you know, can be multiplied for many, many examples we will find, especially in the 1500s in Rome, but also in Florence. Uh, the Medici are perfectly absorbing the lesson of the classics. And uh, through patronage, uh, they are filling the last link for the legitimization. I've picked two or three examples uh, because I'm on the many, evidently the most, uh, most I think, uh, challenging and, and, and interesting because uh, through the deep culture of Cosimo the Elder, who also employed you know, Greek speakers to read Plato and Aristotle in, uh, in, uh, in uh, original language, avoiding translations, uh, he was, Cosimo was speaking from, from the classical tradition, from the knowing perfectly that in front of himself, he had a city, a city in itself on the whole deeply Christian. So I think that nowadays, uh, should you be a politician, you, you need to really pay attention you know, to what you're saying because the own audience is uh, really diversified in itself. At that time, everything was easier because it was a very monolithic kind of society, simply deeply Christian. So you could not be you know, following uh, the Jewish tradition or the Muslim tradition. You could, because Florence uh, never persecuted both creeds. And again, this is another thing should, which should be probably analyzed uh, deeply. A very tolerant city, the creation of the mythological imprinting of Florence, and so on and so forth. But it is evident that everybody knew who David was. Everybody knew who Judith was. Everybody knew what the dome meant. And David, everybody knows that he's the hero, the loser who wins on the strong one. David winning on Goliath. But in this case, you know, I'm thinking about Bernini. I don't know if you've been in Rome at the uh, Galleria Borghese, you know, one of the most beautiful Davids in which David is throwing the stone, you know, winning on, on Goliath. In this case, David is not a hero. David is a, a young guy in his youth, eh? sword in hand, um, more feminine than masculine, embodying perfectly the nature and the identity of what Cosimo was trying to sell to everyone at that time. David as a, not necessarily the prophet, but David, the person open to include people, not in the act of war, not in the act of winning. And of course, this David was commissioned first for the courtier of his palazzo. And everybody was going there because it is evident that the, the other act which was done by Cosimo was changing the architectural parameters of power moving from Palazzo Vecchio to his own private house, Palazzo Medici Riccardi. And of course, uh, giving the money to uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, you know, the, the completing of the dome I was talking about before 1436. Can you have in a deeply Christian society, a, a, you know, a cathedral without having a dome uncompleted 
I mean, should you contribute to the, com the, the completing of this work of arts, you would have been perfectly accepted by everyone as the saver, no? someone who has contributed, contributed massively to the good of the city. The cathedral is the place of the bishopric. Uh, it's the place of the bishop. And who is the bishop? The bishop is the representative of the Pope at Tsar of Rome. Jacopo da Varagine, 1293, the Chronicle of Genoa, talks clearly about the power of the bishop in the Renaissance. Nam loquendo proprie civitas non dicitur, qui non episcopali, power decoratur. So a city is not definable that way if it doesn't have a bishop inside. When I was student in the rest of Florence, you know, there was the creation of this new category, quasi città. Prato is a quasi città. <laughs> Prato is, was probably more important than Florence in terms of economical imprinting in the time of Dante, but it was a quasi città, it doesn't have a, any bishop. So historians, I'm remembering an article by Giorgio Chitolini from the arrest of Milan, who was the first one at the end of the 1980s writing down Prato, una quasi città. And Florence was a città, Florence was a city. Florence was the place where the bishopric existed. And uh, of course, you should have had a dome completed. What better than investing money for being considered the best citizen ever? And of course, uh, the third element, and then I'll stop at the fourth, and then I'll let you free. Otherwise, you will kill me. <sighs> Absorbing the cult of the Magi. The Magi, everybody knows who the Magi are. The Magi are the three pagan kings who are devoting their trip to the newborn, Christ. From a pagan perspective into the Christian one, what better than being painted as uh, the three magi traveling in the name, journey in the name of God, journey in the name of Christ. This is uh, uh, one of the walls of the procession of the magi in Palazzo Medici Riccardi, where in the 14, end of the 1450s, and Cosimo, the genius is Cosimo again. So it's Cosimo commissioning this stuff. The artist is nothing more than an artist. Great, but an artist. Everything was in his mind. He had planned everything. Cosimo the elder, the genius, the real genius. Having these people on board meant for him legitimizing himself without standing for any public office, but being perceived as a perfect and ideal citizen of Florence, as Cicero wrote in the Republic, the Repubblica, the citizen at the middle of the rest publica. And uh, the procession of the magic, Benazzo Gozzoli, beautiful cascade of jewels in Palazzo Medici Riccardi, a small chapel, um, it's a nightmare for me because I teach a course on the history of Florence and we go there eight by eight. I usually have classes with more than eight students. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a sacred space in a public lay building. Everybody went to visit Cosimo at that time. Political delegations, uh, uh, VIP people, members of the clergy, everyone was passing there in this huge, fantastic courtyard planned by Michelozzo, controlled and approved by Cosimo. And then on the first floor, you have this beautiful place in which Benozzo Gozzoli had painted uh, whom? The three magi, the three Medici, horseback, you know, followed by the crowd of people, Florentine people. Lorenzo, I don't know if you can see my. Lorenzo is there, gold dressed. Then you have Piero, the Gauti, and Cosimo. Cosimo is not riding a horse. Cosimo is riding a mule. Because he says in his memoirs, a man who rides a mule doesn't invite attack.
The last one is Judith. Judith, uh, the copy of which is in Piazza della Signoria. The original is in Palazzo Vecchio, in the boom of uh, the lilies, which is the place where the priors met to decide for the community. Close to which you have the office of Machiavelli, no? of the notaries and counselors of the state. Judith, the Jewish divinity ready to kill Holofernes. Of course, uh, Judith embodying the city of Florence, again commissioned by Cosimo. Who is she? She is uh, the queen who is uh, reacting to an act of supremacy by the man who is embodying the idea of dictatorship. So Judith embodying uh, sword in hand is simply representing the greatness and the simplicity and the beauty of Florence. Judith is Florence. And of course, is Cosimo himself, because uh, Judith represents exactly the greatness of his uh, fantasy. Thank you very much. Well, th th thank you so much, Fabrizio, for that really fascinating and detailed account of how they did it. Uh, it's because it was a clever, clever game to become the de facto dictator of Florence without ever giving up the facade of being an ordinary citizen, which is what he achieved. I think I explained well. Yeah, so, uh, uh, it, 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 it's an extraordinary uh, game he played and saw off the... Mm -hmm. um, Powerful, but essentially not very intelligent. Now, Bitsy <laughs> in the freshness. <laughs> so, well, that's all I heard. Anyhow, enough for me. And now we, as always, do our questions and answers. So, in the room, if you want to ask a question, put up your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. On the Zoom, if you want to ask a question, probably best to put it in the chats. Um, but if you you can also unmute yourself and talk to us um, if you're feeling bold. But we got a question right in the room, right away from Jan. So, Jan. So you suggested that uh, Cosimo, when he came back in the in uh, after the uh, riots, um, that he he basically was asked back, and he became this great guy. Exactly, how did he do it? How did he create his patronage? Did he buy people? Did he give people jobs? Did he save people from prison? What exactly did he do? <laughs> You raise and rewind. <clears throat> you know, step by step, he conquered the state. It means mostly creating a network of supporters strong enough to give him the possibility of controlling the state. Of course, he gave the money. Of course, he controlled everything. He is controlling one of the main, main banking firms of the West. This could be, I didn't say that, you know, yeah. So so this is a just a curious question because the money, so they had 100,000 gold florins. Do they actually have them sitting in bags in a bank? Like I don't understand mm -hmm. how that actually worked physically. Physically, we are talking about chests like this uh, podium here. <clears throat> and the bank was uh, the bank. Bank, bank, bank means banco. The banco in Italian is this. Is the desk. So in other words, what happened, this from the second half of the 1800s, uh, the 1100s, sorry. So the Florentine bankers went out, mostly from the area of Piazza della Repubblica, which has been renewed recently, and a century ago, outside of their apartments, very close to the area bag in hand and desk in hand, went down, sat on a chair, and sold their money for interest. That's the reason why he's called banca, the bank, not because it's the desk which was used by them. Now, I was saying that the banking system was not really existing in the Renaissance because one of the main problems of the you know Renaissance, let's say also nowadays, is a problem for those who are deeply Christian. But it's usury. You know, so 
how to dribble this uh, kind of harsh penalty should you be damned uh, as a usurer think about the way in which Dante treats them in the inferno usually they were called money changers in fact the guild is the guild of money changers it, they changed currency in their transactions this way they could cover their transactions as well but the way in which he controlled the state was through the bank was through the bank the links of the bank not necessarily paying people but also helping them sharing loans uh, borrowing money uh, assisting people in the case of need, uh, sharing possible dowries to people. One of the main nightmares for these people was uh, providing a dowry for a female child, for a daughter. So with this kind of a mechanism, you create clients. No? The network of supporters is exactly this, you know, the creation of a sort of uh, authorized clients who were working with him uh, for him. Uh, and they were bound to him as well. Before we go to Michael, there's, there's one all up on uh, the Zoom from Jennifer Skeeping. Fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Can you comment on how Cosimo may have arranged influential marriages for his sons to further establish the, the Medici dynasty? So did, did, did Cosimo marry off his sons for, to get influence? Was that part of the strategy? The, the Renaissance is, um, it is very peculiar to the Renaissance, the politics of marriage. Um, they were never an act of love, always an act of power, always. Uh, sometimes we have, we are in front of happy marriages, sometimes not. Let me quote two of them. 1469, the marriage between Lorenzo the Magnificent and Clarice Orsini. Or another one, one century later, between, between Cosimo I and Eleanor of Toledo, for example. In both cases, we are in front of people who never met before the celebration of the marriage, but who were lucky enough to spend uh, the their marriage life in a, in a joyful way. And when we have uh, the loss of uh, Eleanor, um, of uh, Clarice Orsini, Clarice coming from one of the most established baronial families of Rome, meaning that Lorenzo at that time had the chance of combining or putting together the Medici Bank with the Papal State, the beginning of this relationship, which would have continued in the following century, you know, we have evidences that he was desperate for, for years and never went back to his uh, normal life after the loss of his wife. The same is for uh, Cosimo I. So when he married Eleonora di Toledo, we have the agreement between uh, the, the Duchy of Tuscany at that time. We are in one century later. Florence was already established as a duchy, a ducal regime. The model we are in front of is that of England nowadays. You know, in England, they have also a prime minister, not only a, a, a king nowadays. So it's a Republican monarchy. Hmm? Um, the monarchy of uh, the Medici uh, forced Cosimo the first in this case, uh, to get married with uh, one of the most important families of Spain, Eleanor of to from Toledo. And this was, again, a very happy marriage but not because they chose to get married, simply because uh, they found themselves lucky enough to live and spend a good life. I'm, I'm just going to uh, interrupt before we go to the next question to remind our Zoomers that we're delighted to have you with us always, um, but we allow you to join in without any uh, fee. And we do encourage you and feel very grateful if you make a little contribution to our uh, just giving sight of whatever you feel comfortable with, and Sarah will put the link up for you now. So thank you in advance to all of you for helping us out. Uh, now, Michael's got a question about that. More than a, a question. Um, a big thank you for not only an interesting lecture, but Pleasure. a brilliant lecture. Pleasure. Absolutely brilliant. And it fits perfectly well with Simon's objective of the cultural program at the moment to have lectures which will increase our knowledge of Florentine history, culture. And I think tonight it has been absolutely 
supreme contribution to that, I would only like to ask that it could be printed as one of our documents, maybe in some way or another, because it needs to be reread and rethought about. Um, and you have made an incredible contribution to the purpose of our current um, cultural program. And I can't thank you more than that. Um, it's, it's an observation rather than a, than a question. Anyhow, the question is, can we produce it? <laughs> Ah, thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I don't know whether you've got it written down, Fabrizio, or whether you just did it off the top of your head. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, we got we got one up in the, the Zoom um, from Jose Soto. Um, why were the Strozzi not so famous of, as the Medici if they were wealthier? Because they didn't have the same intelligence as Cosimo had. So Cosimo was simply great enough to understand that the first to gear to lead a state was send right messages, precise messages. And he knew perfectly that the audience was deeply Christian. So picking from the Bible or picking from Christianity would have meant for him creating consensus. We've got another one in the room here. Oh, thank you. Just fascinating. Uh, talking of marriages, um, how did the marriages of Caterina and Maria the Medici reflect on Florence. <clears throat> so they opened Florence to France in both cases. There is a small chapter in that the, the, um, the two books I wrote were um, are nothing more than textbooks for my courses. Um, in other words, they are not exhaustive to the field, but they tried to pick the main and the most important uh, moments of the history of both the Medici families was the history of Florence. When Maria de Medici arrives in France, uh, we are in the middle of uh, the conflict between uh, the Huguenots, the Protestants in France and the Catholics. Um, so having her, Caterina, of course, yeah, Caterina, so we have uh, exactly you know, her imprinting, determining the resolution, which was not so easy to be made with uh, her three sons, you know, in uh, the second half of the 1800s. The same is for Maria. Uh, of course, Maria mm, serves as well, you know, to the politics of marriage. And uh, in this case, it is Clement VII, who is... Uh, thinking about how to enlarge and create this triangle between the Republic of Florence, now Dachi, the Papal State, and France, which is something which will remain until Napoleon, more or less. So they contributed massively to that greatness okay, of the Okay, Okay, um, thank you very much. Does anybody on the Zoom want to unmute and talk to us? We'd love to hear your voices in the room. Um, anyone feeling that they got something to say? All right. Any more in the room? Because we're beginning to run out of time now. I've got two more. We'll take those, probably the last two, unless anyone else is desperate. Um, very quick question. Lovely, lovely lecture. Um, I was surprised to see the Bardi in the list of people that Cosimo didn't like when he was married to a Bardi and he had one working in his bank. Can you explain that? Or <clears throat> the Bardi family, uh, you know, what's a very, very important kind of... Uh, uh banking for uh let's say through the 1300s so after the failure of the Bardi and the peruzzi in the 30 1340s uh, we have a progressive decreasing of the Bardi family within the city so the golden age of the Bardi family it's exactly in the moment in which giotto was painting the chapel devoted to both families the peruzzi and the Bardi in santa croce the <clears throat> The, 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 the church uh, of the Franciscans in the city of Florence. Let me say that we are talking about two different worlds because, because uh, being a money changer at the time of the Bardi was not comparable to being a banker in the time of Cosimo. So the international profile, which should have been necessary for a person like Cosimo was not necessary for those who were living in the time of Dante. 
once I had a chance of following the, um, of writing down an article on Giotto di Bondone, which has been published by recently in 2017, um, and and uh, following the commissions he received, uh, you can see perfectly that he's following the path of the bankers, mostly the Bardi. You know, the, and where does he work? He works in Florence for the Franciscans, also for the Dominicans in Santa Croce, but mostly in Rome, and then he goes to Padua. And uh, so wherever you go, you find podestas, people who are professionals, uh, politicians uh, who are sent to lead the judicial system of these places. Uh, and some of them are members of the Bardi family. So this connection is very clear, no? I, I just like to echo the comments about the lecture. I enjoyed it tremendously. Um, just a, a quick one about a remark you made about the color red that Cosimo, uh, you mentioned it was the color of purity. I thought that white was the color of purity. I mean, all black, huh? <laughs> the color of colors, you know, from the 1500s, the color of purity, you know, uh, becomes black, the synthesis of every colors. Oh, there is a fantastic book written by Ameteo Kwanda, Tutti i colori del nero, no? because ne nero is the synthesis of all colors. Cardinals are red dressed. And of course, uh, the connection between uh, the connection, the quotation that Cosimo is doing uh, is uh, that one. All the symbols he adopts are connected to the world of Christianity. And again, the question is uh, straight. Uh, was he a really deep Christian believer? Was he not? Was he really convinced of what he was doing or was everything a strategy to obtain legitimization, meaning political power? The others are not necessarily written, you know, dressed in red, but he's always and only dressed in red. There's one very last one from Robert Malka, who you can see. Hi, Robert, you can wave to us. You can see you in the room. Yeah, there he is. Um, and what he wrote in the comment was, what specifically was the source of conflict between Cosimo and the Strozzi? Why were they fighting? So in this in this case, it is uh, like Apple and Windows, you know, it's a... Yeah. So we are talking about wealthy, wealthy, wealthy families. So, so the, the difference between them is simply connected to the ability of sharing messages, communicating messages. Uh, so there are no specific differences between one and the other. Palastrozzi, we have brilliant articles written on him, was a very wise kind of person, uh, very talented, a great banker who reinvested in patronage as well, but probably chose not the right patronage, you know, not the right path for being considered. And sometimes history happens without a specific reason. One of the first question I was posing at the table of discussion when I entered the University of Florence as an undergrad, uh, studying medieval history to Giovanni Cherubini. Why Florence and not Pisa? Why Florence and not Arezzo? Why Florence and not Prato? Can you give me an answer why Florence is more important, uh, even if Pisa was more important than Florence in the 1800s, in the 1100s? And he said, you know, sometimes it's quite impossible, you know, to answer these kind of questions because of geographical, geographical reasons, but also Pisa is very close to the Arno River, you know. Sometimes, you know, things are happening with no specific reasons. And that's probably the only possible way to approach this kind of question, because of the Albizzi, the Strozzi, the, Fa the, the, the Medici, the Martelli, the Caponi were all at the same level at that time. Maybe Paolo Strozzi was the Elon Musk of his time. <laughs> Oh, okay, on, on that rather flippant note, I think it's time to wrap it all up. Raya uh, Jetmal on the uh, Zoom says, thank you, fascinating talk, and I think we'd all agree to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, and now I, I hope his, the Zoomers have been doing the wise thing and drinking a, a glass of wine whilst they've been listening to the talk, because those of them have to, had to wait till now, but now they, they do get their wine, um, because as always, I invite you to go through to the uh, Sala Acton for um, a glass of 
Peronule wines, Peronule <laughs> from the roof and our, our, our wine partners this month. So go through and enjoy some of that. And if you want to buy a book, uh, I'm sure, there. sure that uh, Fabrizio will sign it for you. And, and uh, you know, the, 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 that's going to have more of this detail that you've enjoyed so much. And how much are they? Do you know? I don't know. Oh, well, they're, they're not very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be cheap. <laughs> and, but he will sign them. So uh, the books are for sale. The wine's still there. And thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week. Grazie.